What's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of Crypto Tips. My name is Toby. And my name is Heidi. And let me start with this really quick. Okay, remember that Charlie Munger guy? His, he's like best friends with uh, Warren Buffett. Um, so he is really pissed off right now. Okay, so this is what he says. Of course, I hate the Bit Bitcoin success. Uh, and the whole development is disgusting and contrary to the interests of civilization. Wow, he really missed the boat. And But this is really good news, guys, because these people um, hate decentralization. Yeah. They love central law. They work for... They, they own governments, all right? How can he they, possibly defend that statement without coming off as a complete megalomaniac because he's reaching out to people that might be kind of ignorant and stuff and and trust warren buffett and not his friends absolutely not and i think that's why he did it and so it's more scaring people off so that they do miss the boat and so that him and his friends can buy some bitcoin because they did realize that or, yeah well they realized they missed the most amazing wealth transfer in the in the history of the world yeah, I mean, I think it's two sided. Not only are they like wanting maybe to get their own position, but also they want to take advantage of people uh, investing in or participating in their system. Yeah. And of course, they're not going to encourage the uh, competition or the disruption that they're on the brunt end of. So definitely two sided and definitely special special interests and conflict of interest. Heavy, heavy Much statement. Of that. I mean, th these guys own banks. <laughs> So guys, Patreon members, congratulations from my last trade alert uh, with yeah. ETH. I was been talking about ETH a lot lately. Kind of understanding that it was going to break out, but you know, there's been so much speculation like, hey, ETH is going to break out, but it's got like it's going to be tested like five times. You know, I, I laugh at these guys on Twitter like, okay, yeah, you you know, it's going to test five times i'm like it's gonna it's gonna break out when it breaks out and yeah. i just saw the strength of the eth price and i'm like okay yeah. well great and guess what happened when eth hit three thousand i just sent mm -hmm. a little bit of eth over to another platform and a transaction boy that was one dollar and fifty cents for this transaction yeah. which i was expecting to literally cost like 50 60 dollars wow that's pretty incredible so yeah, yeah. boom we're loving yeah. it yeah so can't wait yeah. to see what actually happens really in july hmm. when that's the iep 1559 rolls through but anyway guys uh welcome to the show this is our version of the weekly live streams that we normally did but we had a mix things up a bit so uh we've been sourcing ama questions ask me anything questions from our patreon members and uh, we do put that questionnaire out every saturday and uh, we do these filmings on mondays so this should be about three videos two to three videos anyway we'll they'll be coming out so let's get into the question sure let's do it yeah for okay. sure uh first off hi guys i know you're gonna get bombarded by questions so let's start how can how big can a ten thousand dollar portfolio perform in this bull market i know it is impossible to call a top or a certain number but approximately how big can this bull market transform it the portfolio is exactly as yours let me let, so let, let, let me start at this, this point during bit. this uh bull run that yeah. that's that's actually a really fun question because yeah. like i can take from what I recent or I did when I first started, mm -hmm. um, or actually like three years after I first started, or two or three years, I got into Ethereum, right? And so Ethereum was at seventy dollars, or sorry, seventy cents. So, um, so when <laughs> I got it, off there. yeah, yeah, sorry, seventy cents. <laughs> and so I remember getting into it and like, okay, well, I'll put a you know couple hundred bucks. If I put ten thousand dollars in, mm -hmm. like. My goodness, because it went from 70 cents from when I saw it, and then it backtracked a little bit, finally broke a dollar. Then it, you know, within like a year, it hit like 20 bucks. Yeah. So that's 20x. If I put $10,000 in at even a dollar, that would have been $200,000. Yeah. So, guys, we don't know how far this can go because look at all the big interests that are going into this space. 2017, 18. That was all retail. 
Yeah. This is big money. And as something we're also talking about as Bitcoin has kind of pretty consistently this bull run hit new all time highs, um, maybe slowing down a bit lately. Ethereum, I think, has a lot to kind of catch up with. And because of that, I think it's going to gain the attention of these investors that we're always talking about. Now, the narrative between Bitcoin and Ethereum is quite different. Uh, now, the narrative of Bitcoin is it is an excellent and the hardest asset ever to exist. It's an excellent hedge against inflation. Ethereum is it has an unlimited supply, but it has an extremely solid network effect. And it is the hub of where uh, financial innovation and how you can have your money really working for you in different ways through DeFi is huge. Um, and it's all happening on Ethereum. And there's, uh, there's a lot to be said about Ethereum for Most sure, it but it's not, on Ethereum. Uh, yeah, uh, like the vast majority is happening on Ethereum. And um, so it, it's a different use case. It's a different narrative. So it's probably, it's not going to, I'm not saying it's going to do the same as Bitcoin, but it's definitely, um, gaining a lot more traction, I think, with these new investors, especially for people who are coming in. So many times people are, you know, thinking, oh, Bitcoin's too expensive. Uh, what what can I get into that yeah. isn't Bitcoin? And so oftentimes it goes to Ethereum or whatever. So, yeah, they don't yeah. understand the supply issues yeah. and everything surrounding that. Yeah. So, yeah. Next question. What are your thoughts on crypto indices? I like them. I think it's... Um, a good idea for somebody that maybe doesn't understand the space, doesn't want to learn about the space very much, has no clue, doesn't want to, you know, excel his experience with this space. And just, you know, it's probably for a grandfather or a grandmother or something like that. And, and, and at least they get an, you know, exposure, exposure to this, yeah. you know, like, I mean, it'd be perfect for my mother. Yeah. <laughs> you I, know, like she doesn't want to learn anything anymore and I'm like all right well it'd be great for somebody like that to yeah to I mean there's definitely pros and cons for example like uh, there's all different kinds of crypto indexes some of them follow just based on mar market cap um, maybe just like different types of cryptos different parameters but let's look at this one Maha uh, CoinGecko digital asset index also known as Magix um, what it does it's a comp it's uh, including 60 of the top cryptos based on market cap it's recalculated every five minutes and it's weighted so basically the higher the market cap of the coin the more higher percentage of allocation it is within um, this index and it has performed pretty well uh 69 694 percent in the past year i think bitcoin if you put everything into bitcoin compared to just this index you'd be up like 580 for 580% roughly for the year. Um, now keep, keep in this mind- This is a bull run. The, the year for Ethereum is like, what, $90 to- Yeah, no, exactly. This, and I mean. that's, it's um, definitely, I, cons I consider a conservative approach in crypto for sure. Um, and it's during a bull run, so it's gonna do well. I think it'd be much more interesting to, to see yeah. how these perform during a bear market. Yeah. So for those of you who are new to cryptocurrencies and you don't know how to handle when prices, a bear market means prices, you get lower lows and lower highs. That's what a bear market is. It's the opposite of a bull run. Some people don't know how to deal with it. So take a look at, at a crypto index. It could be your best but, bet. But keep in mind, you know, you don't own your private keys. That's guys. very true. Like that's the biggest thing which which I would cringe at. The yeah. only reason I liked it like it because I know some people, like my mother I've said, would never want to learn anything about this space and just wants to just be hand, you know, here. Hand fed. Here yeah. you go. Yeah. And so that's the way to get her in. If that's the way, then I'd be so happy for that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if you're also, if you're looking at an index like this that is composed based on the market cap of the coin, it puts... 50, for example, this one is 52.88% Bitcoin because Bitcoin has the largest market cap of all the cryptos and it's listed by that. It's kind of the opposite, not necessarily the opposite, but uh, a different approach to what we're doing uh, on our Patreon group or what other people, you know, 
the the point is to find smaller market cap coins, put a little investment in that, and then when they pop, you see a much larger return. Um, and again, that's that's more most likely to happen yeah. during a bull run. So that's what we've been preparing for this past what two years now almost of our patreon group yeah. um so yeah it's it's definitely a conservative approach and it could work for you if you're overwhelmed with trying to research all these different coins if you don't have a community of people to bounce ideas off of if you're it's a good way i think to to start to get exposure to crypto and kind of be introduced to it at least yeah and some of these coins on here i mean i wouldn't I even bother Tron. buying i mean well there's no few, come on like i mean there's you know, but there's Bitcoin there's also plenty Bitcoin that we diamond. have in our own portfolio as yeah, well. Like, if you guys are interested, I know we're talking about our Patreon a lot. These are the people, our Patreon members are the ones supplying us with these questions. Um, they have access to our portfolio. I just did a, a monthly update on that. Our trade alerts whenever they happen and also classes. So for those of you who are new to crypto, you want to know what you should pay attention to security wise, some tricks that make it very easy to interact in crypto. Um, it could be very helpful for you. So check out the link is down below in the video description. But OK, let's go to the next one. Okay. What is your percentage drop protect prediction for the upcoming bear market? Everyone says 80 to 85 percent, but Toby, this guy over here, <laughs> almost said what he thought on your last video. Keen to hear your thoughts so I can plan. Thanks. I mean, eight. Okay, like guys, 80 to 85 percent. I mean, if that is very typical if, if you look at the past. Sure, but we're, the past bull runs are, are bought by retail. I like know. Now we're experiencing like custodianship from banks and like the U.S. Bank just announced that they were going to hold people's Bitcoin for yeah. them. Yeah. Like, and this is also something is that we've, we've talked about for a long time as well as is the fact that, okay, crypto is still a very small market compared to most other asset classes, investment opportunities, but it is yeah. growing. And we've said this from the start is that, you know, trying to help people stomach the volatility that comes with crypto is because it's so small, big investors can really affect the price uh, violently in, in crypto. And now we're seeing it grow and maybe it's not going to be as violent as it was before. Because again, like you said, it's not retail. People are investing for different reasons. The narrative is different. There's a lot of uh, moving parts in how this particular bull run can play out. And that's what we're always talking about for so long. But it's yeah. you, I think it's best to be aware and to know the possible outcomes. But for something like this, like asking for a percentage change, that's for me, fine. I think that's hard because no you don't know how is. high it's going to go. Yeah. But I think what's better is to try to have an understanding of, of what the floor would be. You know what I mean? And we've also I mean, talked about when people like Michael, Michael Saylor, MicroStrategy, and Tesla, whatever, they're buying in. Is that establishing a new floor? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like, you're not going to... A gonna new support I don't... level? Okay, so if, if Bitcoin goes to a million dollars, just yeah. say that. If it goes to a million dollars, which I doubt it will on this, this on this cycle. Yeah. But if it does, then, you know, if it reaches b back down to forty to sixty thousand dollars, I mean, all right, cool. Like that's yeah. that's a big price, you know, decrease from its top. Yeah. But 40, I mean, 45. look how hard they tried to push yeah bitcoin from there's a 64, lot of people 000. willing to buy dips now for yeah sure. from yeah exactly from sixty four thousand all the way down and like guys we're talking so many billionaires involved in this space yeah. with a decreasing like supply of bitcoin you know like people right now are losing their private keys because more and more people are entering the space they're learning so keep in mind, you, you have about 6 million Bitcoin that are off the table for good. Like people mm -hmm. that had mined at first and all that other stuff. And even Hal Finney once said, or was it, how, yeah, Satoshi Nakamoto. Satoshi Nakamoto. Once said that, you know, any, every Bitcoin mm -hmm. that's lost is like a... Um, a contribution to the value of Bitcoin in the long term. Exactly. You're, so You're lending knows. to the scarcity of the coin. For sure. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, I think this is great. This is super bullish. And uh, I, I can't see... I, I mean, especially with Bitcoin's uh, supply is not going to, do, uh, you know, increase or decrease more than, you know, what Based it's supposed to. Based on what the deba demand is. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, and this is what we're seeing when 
just you know companies are investing in Bitcoin. What are we what are we going to see if you know by some miracle government the governmental level are going to be investing in Bitcoin as as their reserve asset? That could be epic. That that's already starting, guys. Even, that's already starting. That's already starting. I mean, you know that when you have Char Charlie Munger talking, who is best friends with Buffett, who hmm. makes decisions for what a name governments. Is that, by the way. Yeah, uh, <laughs> you know he's definitely buying Bitcoin, and he's pissed off because he has to buy. These guys like to buy usually early, except yeah. Warren Buffett when it comes to tech stocks, which he missed the boat on that. But uh, yeah, I think um, you know. With that said, th there's not they're not going to be able to yeah. sell without losing all their profit as well. So especially mm. if it reaches a th like a hundred thousand yeah. or whatever, like these guys like uh, Michael Saylor, you know, he's not going to sell any of it. He's going to take collateral off his Bitcoin. Yeah. I mean, which will be covered great. in the next video coming out the day after uh, this one is published. Sure. Uh, check out, uh, check it out. Okay, next question. What's your viewpoint on solutions like Casa? Feels like a pay for peace of mind setup, but then it's also using a phone. Also, website and keys.casa. Um, okay, so Casa Wallets is definitely a custodianship solutions service. It is built by Jameson Lop, a really cool cypherpunk guy who is uh, contributed a lot to Bitcoin and uh, how the space has uh, developed and is especially a good source for those of you who want to learn more about how to secure your coins in general, just uh, general practices. Anyway, Casa, yes, um, things like multi-sig wallets, if you don't know what that means, is that there can be like um, three parties involved that will have to come together to unlock a wallet to be able to spend the coins. Usually you'll have like three keys or five keys and then like two out of the three or three out of the five have to come together to be able to unlock a wallet. So let's say I have a private key and I lose it or it gets stolen. It gets stolen, let's say. Um, the person who stole it cannot gain access to the coins unless um, another they get gain access to any of the others required. So it is definitely a much more secure way to uh, store cryptos. It's how most centralized exchanges deal with their cold storage of their coins. Um, it's usually how any kind of centralized entity deal with that. Also happening with the DeFi space with any of these like God mode admin keys usually function with multi-sig. So not like one guy can't go rogue and just completely mess with the network. Um, there's a lot to go in there, but yes, for sure, it is definitely a pay for peace of mind kind of a thing. I think it's also a great way for you to get introduced, kind of have your hand held on um, how to secure your wallets. Definitely an introduction to that. You can learn how they, uh, the practices that they use basically for your benefit and then learn from that and then, you know, go off and do it yourself. Cause that's the beauty of crypto is be your own bank and you can secure it very, very, well um, on your own if you have the time and energy to learn how to do it. It's uh, very freeing. And you sleep really well knowing that even if somebody robs you at gunpoint, yeah. that person ain't getting anything, yeah, even gonna if I wanted to. They're probably going to be pretty pissed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that <laughs> is a danger. Let's, let's not put that out there in the I'm just saying. Um, it's, it's great. It's fun. But, but definitely something to be concerned about if you want to use something like Casa Wallet Solutions or anything similar is this concept of privacy because they will, in a way, know that you are involved in cryptocurrency. You have a certain amount that you feel needs to have an extra layer of security. Maybe it's a large amount of, of money in cryptocurrency. Um, so as with anything, I think it's smart to hedge in different ways. So maybe, you know, you're just checking this out um, if, if you're, again, being introduced to crypto. Um, but just keep in mind that it's not the most private way to interact with crypto because you are, you are involving a third party that is centralized. Um, and if you read their terms and conditions, because they're centralized, I know it's going to say something like, you know, we must abide by laws because um, that's how it works. I mean, multi-sig doesn't have to be centralized. No, I'm, I'm talking about CASA. For sure. those who are new and like you, you want 
to have a multi-sig wallet, but you don't have the wherewithal or the resources to do it yourself, you can you can use something like this. Yeah. And it's definitely something to pay attention to because it's what I know a lot of actual, like these institutional investors have been using kind of third party multi-sig wallets. And the thing to pay attention to are these companies that are servicing a lot of these different um, investors at the same time. That's a security thing to, to pay attention to Honey as pot. well for hackers, absolutely. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, everything in moderation, right? So this as well, and just know that it's not the most private way to store your crypto if that's something that you're worried about. Um, I talked a lot about that question <laughs> anyway. Um, next up. This is an interesting one. With all this bullishness sentiment, do you think you could regularly provide at least one credible good counter on the bearish side that you don't believe is FUD to help keep things level and in perspective? Cycles, guys. Cycles. Yes. That's it. Like, I th things don't go up forever. They just don't. Unless you have a printing press. <laughs> so. And even so. then... Bitcoin. <laughs> Even then, you don't, you can't print more Bitcoin. So um, no, I mean, yeah, it's cycles are always going to take part of crypto, right? Regardless of guys that say, okay, we are fully into a what do you call it, the um, a super, super cycle. cycle. You know, if it's still. Even if it's super cycle, it's going to go in waves. Yeah. And that's just what happened. I mean, look at what happens with alts and Bitcoin. You know, it still goes in waves. Yeah. Like you see Bitcoin rising and then alts go up and then blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And even so, if it's a super cycle, it's not going to be a perfect straight line up. Yeah. It's because humans are the ones investing in crypto and especially crypto investors are hyper emotional because most people have never invested anything in their life. You don't wanna know how many times we are asked what APY means. Oh, no. um, yeah. So that's a huge indication of the, the type of newbies that we're dealing with here, let alone, like I'm not, I'm not foolish enough to think that most of the crypto investors know to buy low and sell high that they know that markets run in cycles, that humans are cyclical and emotional, and it's it's inevitable, right? But, yes, but with, with that said, I had to learn all of this. Yeah, we all Heidi did. Heidi had to learn Absolutely. all this. Absolutely. We were all noobs at one point, you yeah. know, and that's pretty much why we have this going on, because, yeah. you know, I wish I had something like this when I first started in crypto. Tell me about it. <laughs> Goodness, I wish I had something like this. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think it's really important, even to, if you think a, a question is stupid or whatever, just ask, you know, yes. like whatever, you, you're going to learn it. Yes. You're going to feel like it's kind an of easy, it, but we, we've all been there. It's yeah. fine. Yeah. Um, next question. Hi guys, I would like to know more options of using Bitcoin as collateral for loans, etc. So we don't have to ever convert back to fiat. I understand Heidi's concern with BlockFi. So what other options might there be? Is there a non-custodial option for loans? It seems it would also save on taxes to just live off these types of loans instead of cashing in crypto. Yeah, BlockFi is great. You know, you have other ones. You have Aave, which is... Um, we'll talk about non-custodial ones, yeah. Yeah, so Aave, you can have compound. like BlockFi, which is completely centralized, like ridiculously centralized. Same as Celsius, same as Voyager, same as Nexo. There's a lot of yeah. popular centralized options. Um, so mix it up a little yeah. bit, you know? You can take advantage of all of them if you, if you want to. Uh, just like we were saying before with your wallet options, decentralize it, right? Like don't put all of your eggs in one centralized basket. Uh, spread it out and see how one works better than the other. What, just test it out, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and talking about non-custodial, yeah, like you said, Aave, Compound. These are the DeFi platforms that are uber popular and actually They've been, they've gone through the gauntlet of the bugs and the loopholes in their code that have been spotted. And it's actually been kind of quiet with the DeFi loophole situation. So that could be good because certainly it's not like DeFi is suddenly not being used anymore. So maybe it's a bit more secure than when I first started talking about DeFi, all the risks involved. I think those risks are still there, but maybe it's just like, um, they're coming, they're becoming a little bit more, uh, all the attack vectors are being 
remedied and every, it being an open source system people are learning from each other so and, that's and, cool. I, and I like Ave a lot we've been it's involved a great with, coin it started with Lend which yeah we actually took the a couple of the developers surfing yeah it was of course. They're, they're really cool guys yeah uh, incredibly smart they've been in this space for forever and um, yeah yeah I was like heck yeah I'm getting into this and it changed Ave which is yeah. I'm like, what? I, no, yeah, that I'm, was, that was I'm weird. a big fan of Ave for sure. <laughs> but I'm like, okay, whatever. <laughs> and now it's been really popular, so it's yeah. great. Yeah. And in regards to taxes, I mean, I, I've, I'm assuming maybe you're a U.S. citizen. I'm trying to avoid going from crypto to fiat or crypto to crypto at all is at this point a taxable event. So for me, thinking about the U.S. and how they're going to be addressing crypto taxes, I feel like they're going to want to tax any and everything that they can. Um, so maybe at this point it's not a taxable event, but it very could be, be that in the future. So, um, just keep that in mind. Okay. Last question here. What is your opinion on yield farming, fusion pools, etc.? Some really interesting options available on radium at the moment, but I'm not sure if it's something I want to get into. Seems kind of risky due to impermanent loss. I'm really new to this and don't fully understand it yet. Thanks. I mean, I love yield farming. Yeah, uh, I've, fusion pools is really cool because you can uh, you can farm and actually get several different coins at one time. So, for instance, if you're farming like whatever, and you can get um, like ninety percent API for like radium, and then seventy percent for like Solana or something like that. So, yeah, it's it's really cool. It's a it's a new way of doing things, and I mean the space is constantly evolving. And the coolest thing about this is like, cause I am, um, uh, I'm really, I really like farming and We're even gonna though- We're going to get you a straw hat soon. I know exactly. So like, <laughs> like it's so cheap on radium and it's so yeah, fast yeah. because Solana, it's ridiculous. Yeah. And, but now ETH is, is it getting cheaper? I know that's like, it's really interesting seeing the kind of back and forth because obviously there is a use case for faster, cheaper uh, blockchains like Solana, like Polkadot, like all these, uh, you know, F competitors or second layer solutions, whatever. But when it comes down to it, if Ethereum does hit that scalability, does get those transaction fees oh, knocked down, boy. so it's even, you know, as it should be Yikes. open to everyone to participate, it's very hard to compete with the network effect that Ethereum has. So. Yeah. I can only imagine people are pouring, like it's it's not gonna take long for the news to get out that the transaction fees are low again on Ethereum. I do wanna touch on impermanent loss. Um, I've actually done a video on it. If you wanna just check, just search impermanent loss, crypto tips or something, and I'm sure the video will pop up. Basically, it's what happens when you're lending liquidity to a pool. And basically you're saying, okay, for example, I have apples and oranges for sale. And if you want to buy an apple, you have to give me an orange. <laughs> so if all of a sudden, let's say, based on outside market prices, uh, the price of your apples are a little bit cheaper than everyone else. So they're going to take advantage of that. And a lot of people are going to want to buy more of your apples. And that means you get more oranges and less apples. And law of supply and demand, basically, uh, because you have less apples, they're more scarce. Therefore, the value of it is higher um, and your oranges are cheaper. Right? So then that means that more people are going to want to buy your oranges because they're cheaper uh, compared to, again, the outside market prices. And then it, it kind of equals out that way. Also kind of like arbitrage trading for those of you who are familiar. Uh, a permanent loss means that when at the time when you want to basically reclaim your liquidity that you originally provided, you're probably not like 99% of the time, you're not going to get back exactly the same uh, proportion uh, amount of each coin as you uh, first submitted. And based on uh, the coins that you did submit, maybe uh, they're both kind of particularly volatile. You might end up with a dud, <laughs> much more so than the valuable coin that you have much less of because more people wanted to actually buy your Ethereum or let's say your Ethereum and they wanted to dump the, the other crap coin that you were trading against. And so you end up with a whole bunch of crap coin and not so much Ethereum. That's basically impermanent loss. One way to kind of hedge against this is to use a stable coin. Uh, within your like as the matching as the as the 
other side of the trade basically is one way to kind of mitigate that risk. But it's definitely something to pay attention to and to for sure be aware of, especially when you're thinking about um, things like yield farming and liquidity providers and stuff. Yeah, watch out for unaudited projects as well. So yep. if your project isn't audited correctly, then you can get the rug pulled from underneath you yep. and hackers can suck out all your liquidity. Yep. And the next thing you know, you're left with nothing. And that is definitely a permanent loss. Yep. And if you want to know about that, check out a video I did a couple months ago, probably something about DeFi red flags. Also, if you guys are Patreon members, go to the home page and on the top categories, one of those categories is crypto life hacks. Click on that and you'll find um, all of the helpful links for navigating DeFi. Uh, there, there's definitely a lot of um, helpful information there as well. All right, guys. Yeah. Stay disobedient <laughs> and um, we'll talk to you guys later. Yeah. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.